Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Ah, the perfect night for camping. Oh, hi, everybody. This is Nathan, and I want to tell you a campfire story about Battle Bards. Legend says Battle Bards makes the finest role playing audio you can find in these there hills. They have everything from soundscapes to spell effects to, to the sound of something moving around in the bushes. Anything out there? Oh. Um, Battle Bards features their own sound mixer, too, allowing you to meld all those sounds to one awfully disturbing sense that you are being hunted for food. Seriously, what is that? Um, oh, oh, so as a listener of Delve, you can get some extra audio goodness when you sign up for Battle Bards, but I'll tell you about that later because I'm getting out of here. Battle Bards, turn your game to 11. Okay, that, that sounded big. Running, running now. You can have this more. You can have all this more. Hello, and welcome to Delve. My name is Alex, and unfortunately, Nathan has to work at 5 a.m. and won't be joining us tonight because he apparently likes to sleep. So, without Nathan, I'm forced to uh, improvise. So it's just just the Alex show. And tonight, today, whenever this is, whenever Nathan sleeps, we've got Breeze Grigus, the creator of Aegis. Yep. And you're joining us from, like, California now, right? Seattle. Seattle, I'm sorry, West Coast. You're joining us from Seattle, right? It's all the same place. <laughs> One of them gets, uh, gets more wind, I think, right? I believe. Isn't, I mean, is Seattle the, you know, the rainy city or the windy city? I think it's, it's the rainy city. I think Chicago is the windy city. Uh... You know, people see so much stuff about the rain over here, and it's pretty okay. It's not... <laughs> It's the same. It's no different from New England at all. Really? In fact, it's it's all. It's just slightly cheaper, and the rainstorms last for like five minutes instead of like three days. So it's like everyone's like, "Oh man, you're moving to Seattle. It's gonna be. Is it gonna be raining all the time? I'm like, eh, it rains like every hour, but only lasts for twenty minutes. Okay, so it's kind. It's kind of like the northern version of Florida. Yeah, a little bit. And, so it's like, it, it feels like the weather like changes like multiple times per day. Oh yeah. It keeps, Interesting. Well, I mean, it's better than just having boring weather, I guess. Yeah. So last time we saw or talked to you, it was at Boston Festival of Indie Games. Mm -hmm. And Nathan and I were there with our camera getting some recordings. We got to meet you, and that was really cool. And you guys looked swamped the entire time. Every convention. Every convention. <laughs> People just love combining robots, apparently. It seems that way. Which is uh, it was fortunate for you. Because uh, that's what your game is all about. So since Nathan isn't here, I did ask him if he had some questions, and he said a uh, he, he wanted me to ask you. He said Aegis yep. was, uh, as he put it, the hit of Beefig. Did you find more people that wanted uh, to combine robots after the show? Yeah, I mean, it's the fan base is always growing. We've been doing it for a while. Uh, every time we go to a convention, we meet a whole bunch of new people who really like the game, and then of course we meet like a whole bunch of people. We're like, oh, man, I played this game at B-Fig for the last three years. It's great. When's it coming out? Uh, well, the answer is now, I guess. Yeah, we meet a lot of people. And uh, we were able to convert a lot of people who don't normally like like tactics games or whatever. And they just like really like robots. Or sometimes we convert people who don't like robots into uh, being robot lovers after playing your game, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you don't like robots and you get a game and you love it, I mean, who cares if they're robots? Yeah, right? Especially since they're like almost like transforming robots. Yeah, and they look kind of like Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Transformers meets Pokemon, and you can just kind of have fun. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, We try to, even though the game's about robots, I tried to get the art style to uh, appeal to a wide variety of people who aren't just like mecha fanatics. That's That's a thing. Absolutely. I mean, usually you see mech and they're super like uh, Gundam style. Mm -hmm. and uh not everyone likes that i feel yeah so like we have like our cute little robots and our like super awesome like gundam guys and we have guys that look a little bit more like battle tech so try to like uh we have like a swath of different robot art styles in our game but it all still also kind of comes together and is very cohesive looking which was the big challenge yeah i can imagine that uh having different styles like that is a challenge especially when them when you want them to look similar too but it's it's a good thing, I think. Lots of variety for different types of players. Mm -hmm. 
I heard that buzz. You're getting notifications! Of course I'm getting notifications. <laughs> it's, it's all your Kickstarter, so, right? Yeah, pretty much. I just, like, uh, I remember the, the first day of the Kickstarter, I was getting, I was getting slammed uh, from, like, every angle. I didn't know that uh, Kickstarter even had private messages, but I was getting private messages, I was getting emails, new comments, uh, Facebook messages up and down, Facebook notifications, Twitter messages and Twitter notifications. <laughs> it was... It was a very, it was a very, very eventful and overwhelming first day. I feel like that is a uh, good thing to know and a, a good way to learn that you have those notification options. Yes. I was going to say, so your Kickstarter started, I believe, uh, you said the 9th? It did. It started on May 9th, and it will be going until about midway through June. Yeah, it started bright and early in the morning on May 9th. So, so what happens uh, during May 9th, that entire day, because I saw some things on Twitter, and I assume it was a very eventful day. Yes, well, yeah, nonstop social media notifications was the first one, <laughs> and we also managed to, we set our goal this time at like $16,000, and we managed to blow through that almost with, just within like a few hours, and it was very, very wild, and uh, was not quite expected. Um, I thought maybe, yeah, first two or three days we'll get there, and then you know, we'll just like dirtle along for a few weeks and we'll end up with like a nice clean, like I was, ex well, I was expecting our last Kickstarter ended at $30,000. So that's about what I was expecting this time. So I kind of structured all of our stuff and our thought processes around that. Like we're going to make about $30,000 because the game's cheaper this time. That means even if we get like a lot more backers, we might still end up at like 30 K, but now we're like four days in and we're almost at 30,000. So <laughs> Things are definitely uh, changed, and they evolved rapidly. Right, that's that's definitely... If it continues at this pace, you're going to have to find some things to do to make people uh, impressed, I think. Yeah, I definitely structured all of our goals uh, pretty front-loaded. Not all of them, but like a lot of the, like, the uh, expansion... A lot of the actual like robots that get added to the game were uh, pretty close to the start. Um, we still have some prizes in store for the rest of the campaign now but if i had adequately predicted our really really good like first few days success i probably would have padded out the stretch goals a little bit more uh, understandable you probably didn't expect the huge burst right at the beginning that got you that far up huh yeah it was great <laughs> it was un it was unexpected and it's really really cool don't get me wrong it's 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 really really cool it's my phone wouldn't stop buzzing all day long, but I love it. Yep. So uh, this was, I believe, your second Kickstarter, right? Yep. What has changed between the first one you ran and this version of the game? Well, a few different really big fundamental things changed. Last time we were going through uh, the publisher Greenbrier Games. This time we were just doing it full indie. Um, last time we had two boxes that we were launching with, which was like a red box and a blue box. Uh, this time we just put the whole game in one box. Uh, so that's a big thing, and because of that, we kind of ran through and we thought about production and manufacturing in a much different way. We manually went out and uh, talked to pretty much every uh, pretty much every manufacturer that we could find to get as many quotes and to learn as much as possible and uh, make sure we're going to do this right this time. So that, that, those are the big things. We structured we structured the game to give you more content for cheaper, and we. Um, and we had to do a lot of it ourselves. That's the big thing. And of course, because we're doing it all in one box, and we uh, kind of structured the game a little bit differently in terms of physical components, we were able to get the goal down really, really low. As if we were launched uh, at 40,000 was our goal last time, and 60,000 and 16,000 is our goal this time. So that was a big. That was definitely a big difference. I played around with the psychology of Kickstarter a little bit. We wanted to definitely uh, just put the kind of the minimum viable product up there and make sure it gets made this time. Um, and then if we wanted to make it as razzle dazzly as we wanted the first time, then those would be in stretch gold. And lo and behold, we pretty much just hit that. So at the, at the very moment where the game stands, it has more content than it did before. That's, that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. That is that is really cool. You mentioned you're doing it full into your self publishing now with the Zephyr Workshop. Yep. So, uh, what was the like? What was the idea behind that? Why did you change from Greenbrier 
to deciding to self-publish. Any reasoning for that, I assume? Oh, yeah. Um, well, we just, it was like, we had a, like a, we had like a few just like talks with Greenbrier about how like the last Kickstarter was run and stuff. And it was, it's, uh, it's, it's all still very amicable. We still really like Greenbrier. We're helping them out at Gen Con and all that. And they've been really, really helpful with helping like lay a whole bunch of foundation that let us succeed this time. Um, but they're a small company and we're a small company and they have like a lot of projects on their plate that are like much bigger and more extravagant than Aegis. So just knowing that we could either stay with Greenbrier, you know, wait like a year or two or however long and make sure that it kind of syncs up with their schedule or we could just try to do it ourselves because our team is pretty good. We have, uh, we have a lot of different skills on the team. We kind of realized that we could do this ourselves after like the two or three years of just like uh, grinding experience, I guess so we kind of looked, we kind of looked at each other after the last Kickstarter and we thought, you know, we could probably just do this. We can do this um, because we ultimately, we know our game the best. So rather than like putting like all the marketing and stuff in the hands of somebody else, even if those people are awesome, we kind of know how to stay on message with our game the most. And it probably would allow us to uh, have a much better chance to succeed. So that's why we decided to uh, kind of self-publish this time. Cool. No, I can I can totally understand that, especially where you're saying you guys do know the game better than anyone else would. I mean, uh, that's the reason like we talk to you instead of talking like instead of getting the review of a game from someone to us, mm -hmm. Nathan and I on Delve, we love talking to the creators of the game because then they can give you all the passion behind their project. They can tell you what it's about, why there's X, Y, and Z in the game, as opposed to, you know, A, B, or C. And it's ge yeah. it's generally just really, really cool to listen to the people who make a game tell you oh, yeah. all about it. I agree. Good, good. I'm glad someone agrees with it. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, the hopefully our listeners agree with it a little bit. So Nathan also asked, uh, said, since this is your second Kickstarter, did you learn anything from the first time around you can apply this time? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we learned a lot about pretty much everything, actually. Once you do the first, the first Kickstarter, I was like terrified to do because, you know, you can look at a million Kickstarters that go live and your stuff, ones that your friends do or whatever, but you don't really know what it's like to do a Kickstarter until you actually do one. It's like a whole nother experience in and of itself so we learned all sorts of things kind of just stuff about how kickstarter works as like a website how to lay out a campaign uh how to do outreach uh the proper ways for made for like doing ads ads are important um that's actually what i was doing today is making ads this is the most glamorous work in the world and definitely uh dealing with like the influx of like hundreds of people asking you really tough questions about like this or that or like uh how to like control like the flow of information about like if we don't know something how do you say that or if we do know something but we're going to tell them later how do we say that um so that was interesting let's see and then like in terms of like doing all the but doing all the budgeting stuff was a big thing too like making sure we don't we just making sure we know everything about what we're doing regarding shipping the game uh and like the costs associated with that so we don't accidentally like bankrupt ourselves like some other that's like one of the biggest traps that kickstarters can fall into is oh no we accidentally made the box like a, a pound too heavy and now all of our costs doubled so we're we definitely uh, ran all of the numbers to make sure we that won't happen i obsessively went over the numbers <laughs> to make sure that won't happen yeah that uh, that's not a good feeling when you go cool we're done wait our costs just went up by ten thousand dollars yeah great awesome <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that was the biggest fear for me is like what happens if we do something really stupid and we end up in the hole and um that's something that i think everyone who runs a kickstarter has like a terrifying fear of but it should pretty pretty like 99.999 percent positive that we are we are good with that because our game is not you know, our game is not um in terms of production it's not the most complicated thing to produce where no, we don't have like complex minis or things that can really break in the box um, our box is a pretty decent size. It can fit within uh, certain shipping boxes pretty easily. And it's also not very heavy. So yeah, we plan we we plan through everything. We talked to uh, talked to a lot of people about to make sure everything is all good. So, so many, many learning experiences. And also the biggest learning experience is to not bother even trying to launch a Kickstarter with like a fifty thousand dollar goal or whatever. 
it doesn't make any sense. And that's why you'll see a lot of Kickstarters launching nowadays just have a really, really low goal just so they can hit it very early. And then once you've, once you've already succeeded, you have a much better chance of random passersby backing your game because the ambiguity is gone. And then they can just ride the success train all the way to the end. Right. You can but, see a, a Kickstarter that's already been successful and you go, well, it's not going to fail. I might as well get it. Yeah, exactly. And so like last time we probably could have made the $40,000, but just the psychological factor of we were like halfway in and only had about half as much money as we needed. Um, that was, it's just like a thing. You see that and then it's just like, ah, I don't really know if I want to back this, which actually doesn't really make any sense because you don't lose any money from a failed Kickstarter anyway. So I actually go to a lot of Kickstarters that I just think are cool and I just shovel money at them. <laughs> because you don't lose anything if they fail. And if you like the game, you want it to succeed. So yeah, just shovel money at it. Yeah, um, it's a, it goes back to the whole psychology thing of Kickstarter. Oh yeah, and so we've learned a lot about like yeah that whole psychology thing. So we made our goal lower this time, and we have a whole bunch of stretch goals that will keep people entertained throughout so many days. And uh, as opposed to like front loading every up until like a few weeks before the Kickstarter, our main plan was to basically offer everything in the box and have like a twenty to twenty thousand, twenty to twenty five thousand dollar goal. And we decided against that um, because for for like basically all like basically a lot of reasons, like most of them mean like the psychological reasons of, well, if we offer absolutely everything that we could possibly do and just make the goal high enough to compensate, number one, we won't have anything to entertain people during the campaign. Number two, we'll do well. We might end up falling into that thing. Well, we'll get like halfway there in the first few days and then completely stall out until the end. We That's why we ended up just going, you know, like, what if we just put the essentials in the box, launch low, and then we put everything we want to put in over time as we get the money for it. I think that was a much, much better idea. We rebuilt the Kickstarter page like three, four, or five times over the last few months. It was it was an ordeal. I, I can understand that. I know from doing the website for uh, Dell now, I've had I've tweaked with that, and that's just like the website not even running a Kickstarter, and it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, right? We had a really good uh, consultant work with us, too, uh, Dan Zayas, the board game badger. Um, he kind of swooped into our rescue like a month or two ago, and he just started giving us some really good advice on things. Um, so that was, all, that, was also, that, that was also a good person to bring on, because ultimately when you like, we don't quite know how to do something, and you spend all of your time thinking about it you really sometimes you just don't get anywhere as opposed to you know if you just like that take five steps to the right and ask someone who knows a lot more than you do they'll give you really good relevant feedback because that's what i was like i was definitely spinning my wheels with the page for a while until i kind of like asked and all of a sudden a ton of stuff just clicked uh as soon as i started talking to other kickstarter successful people and definitely lent your success quite a bit awesome i i absolutely think that having people who might know more than you or at least have done things you haven't done is really important uh for that exact reason because you're sitting there and you can go what am i doing what do i want to do and they can go hey have you tried this yeah exactly you get a good uh get a lot of good um feedback on, on like uh structuring our tiers and uh, what to do with uh shipping numbers and stuff so that was that was that was, that was good nice so have you guys uh, looked into, like, distribution methods for after you launch, for instance? Are you trying to get it out into stores or just into individuals' hands? Um, let's see. So we, do, we, have, we know a few people just because we've, uh, we've gotten quite a few business cards. We're going to worry about that a little bit afterwards. Uh, we're going to focus on finishing the game and getting it out. But we do have a few people that I'm definitely uh, going to talk to in terms of getting it on retail shelves. Thanks. And I think we're... We might add a retail tier to the current Kickstarter. It's still in flux. We're trying to figure that out. Didn't want to do anything that we didn't fully understand before we launched, so I just kept it to the basic. That's fair. That's that's a pretty fair way to approach that. So the game is basically Pokemon meets Voltron, and there's a, you build a team of five robots, and you play against your opponent's team of five robots, yada yada. Um, and you can combine your robots on your team together to make bigger, more powerful robots. It's like, oh, there's a lot of, there's a big team building aspect to the game. And because of that, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of robots uh, in the game to use. 
And each one has just a card and a piece, and it's all very simple and single-digit numbers, like sided dice. It's all cardboard. The game's 50 bucks this time, uh, free shipping. When we stunned, when we launched the Kickstarter, we had 40 robots in the box, and that's like four kind of uh, preset like teams of 10-ish for you to use. Uh, and they're all tied to different like main characters that we have. We have like these character avatars in the game called Commanders that are also kind of color-coded like the robots are. So we had four of those in the box and 40 robots. And then after the and once we hit $16,000, every $500 or so unlocked five new robots in the game. And we got up to 90 robots really quickly, <laughs> which is the amount of robots that we had that we were going to... That, that's the amount of robots that we have, like, arted and designed for and everything. Um, so it's not like we were adding stuff that we didn't actually plan for. But, uh, yeah, like I was saying, uh, I, I probably could have stretched those out to $1,000 a piece and we would have been fine or kind of uh, chopped them up and interspersed them between, like, component upgrades. Right. But... Now and now as it stands four days in, the box has ninety robots in it, and that's uh that's pretty cool. On top of that, on top of like other stretch goals, we are now moving on to like upgrades to the box itself. Like so you have all these pieces and you have all these robots and you have all this stuff, and the game's like br- is like packed to the brim with cool content. Uh now we are going to do the thing where we're going to make it all fireproof. So <laughs> I think the next uh, the next the next core box the next core box upgrade that we're about to get to at like twenty seven thousand dollars gives uh, everybody. Let me check if this is correct. I'm pretty sure it's correct. Yeah, the one of the first things that we unlock at, in the core box is actually a, a, a plastic insert that keeps all of your pieces together. So that's what's on. I think that's the that's the next unlock, um, which I think is very very vital to the game. At this point, you have ninety robots with 90 cards and 90 pieces, we're going to give you a nice insert that's custom molded to keep all of your stuff in line. So you don't have to like dig through like the bucket of Legos, sort of. You don't want that feel whenever you open our game box. And then after that, yeah, we start getting into upgrades to the pieces because the game uses cardboard standees. So those are being upgraded from standard like glossy punch board stuff to uh, linen, that kind of similar that you'd find in a game like Battlecon. Where the the punch here, the punch out characters kind of feel like they could block a bullet, and they're just really really tough. So we want the game to be reusable over and over again. And then yeah, we uh, then we're gonna upgrade the box. We're gonna upgrade the board. Uh, one of the coolest things though that we just unlocked at twenty six thousand is we have a digital art book that came stock with the deluxe version of the game. Uh, and anyone who wants it can add it for five bucks. Uh, to their core box. But if you have the digital art book, right, there is what we hit at 26,000 unlocks a campaign mode in the game. So now that the game has like 90 robots and like four different game modes to do, we're kind of giving you a way to look at all of that and have it be structured so you can kind of play through it like a uh, kind of like a video game, like a Fire Emblem or an Advance Wars style campaign where you're going to go through like the lore and the, the the lore of Aegis, where all these different kind of factions and characters are fighting with their robots, and go through like uh, different win objectives uh, with you and your friends across like two, four, and six player modes. Nice. Um. So it's like, so yeah, it kind of it's it's one thing to like put like a giant bucket of content on your head, but the campaign mode will be pretty integral to um getting it. Not overwhelming, you know, getting players to do cool stuff with it right out of the box without getting super overwhelmed. And that's kind of like the mechanical function of it. But then we also have like a whole ton of like cool story and lore content that we want to uh, push out. And same thing with pushing out expansions later. Um, we are, we, it just takes place in an evolving world. No, where... I, I definitely like that. Um Optional rules and variant rules for games are always really interesting, and I think where you, before it was uh, essentially just kind of a versus game, I assume, yeah, or a co-op. Yeah, so it's like a game. Mo- it, it just his basic game mode is yeah, one v one, standard like twenty thirty minute games made to be super fast. But then, then we have two player. Then we have four player mode, three player and four player, which can be like two v two or uh, four player free for all. 
And then the deluxe box comes with a big me comes with a big neoprene mat with uh, which is much more popular than I thought it would be. We were actually expecting most of 90% of backers to be at $49 and like 10% to be at 80. It will kind of work the other way around. So now like pretty much everyone who's backing our game is getting this six player neoprene mat, which is neat. Hey, hi, remember me? Yeah, it's Nathan. Uh, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately I was not able to be there for this episode or the subsequent episode because they, they did talk quite a bit about other game modes that Aegis, uh, did and it just, it was, it was going to be too long, uh, to do as one episode. So, uh, yeah, and I know that all of you were, were deeply hurt that I was not part of this episode. Don't worry, I'll be back. You'll be wondering when I'm going to go away again very, very shortly. Um... But uh, but Alex kept going. I don't know what I'm gonna do, and I'm like, you're you're fine, you're fine. And then I listen to it. I'm like, it sounds so good. It just sounds so good. I don't I don't know why he had any trouble with it. And I have to say that you know this is the first episode of the show that I was not in, so it was actually kind of cool being able to listen to the show uh, fresh and, and thinking to myself, oh, this, this show is kind of cool. I wonder who does... Oh, right, it's my show. Right, I forgot about this. I, I'm usually on this thing. Um, so, so that was pretty cool, uh, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it was great for uh, Breeze to come on. Uh, if if I didn't have such an early morning, uh, that would have been uh, great, but I did. So, there. Uh, and, uh, okay, so I'm going to do the outro, so you're at least going to hear me now. Uh, I'm sure that that, you know, calms everybody's nerves. You were really worried beforehand, but now here I am uh, to save the day. Mighty Mouse on its way. So, if you want to find more information about the show, please go to DelveCast.com, uh, and you can uh, you can also find information about how to get to the iTunes, Google Play, all of that, uh, in the show notes right underneath the show, uh, if you are looking at it on the site right now. If you're not, you can go to, as I said, DelveCast.com, go there, and from there we can link you to everything else. And you can also find us on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Citanium. Uh, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Dell Podcast. So there you go. That's us. Now, as for Breeze, ZephyrWorkshop.com is their website, so that you can go over and see more about the robots and the system and the game. Uh, you can also find them on Kickstarter, uh, because their campaign is going on right now. So uh, it's your chance to, to get in. Uh, as he said, they've already funded, so you know that the project is going through, and, uh, and then you can get all the robots that you want. You can put them together. They can hold hands. They can sing Kumbaya. I'm sure that's what the game is about. Pretty sure. Pretty sure. Also, Facebook.com slash Project Aegis uh, is uh, their main way of uh, doing community outreach. Uh, to to get in touch and interact with the people that uh, that are in the gaming community, so so go over to their Facebook page as well and twitch.tv slash Zephyr Workshop. They have uh, actually been doing live streams on Wednesdays, so you can go over and uh, and watch that. And at Zephyr Workshop, uh, Zephyr underscore Workshop on Twitter. So yeah, next week uh, Alex and Breeze will be talking a lot more about the different game modes that you can play in Aegis, which is successfully kickstarted already, but you can of course still go over and get in on the action. You can buy all sorts of robots, there's so many robots, and you can combine them, kind of like Zords, or, or Voltrons. That's a plural, right? You can you can make Voltron into a plural, I don't, re I don't really know. Anyway, uh, so uh, thanks for listening to the show guys. And, uh, and, and I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still relevant. Don't worry. Okay. Bye now. You have been listening to Elvin Dirge, Manai Umvela Atta by Goof Parade, available on BattleBards. We thank BattleBards for sponsoring Dell. Go to BattleBards.com, create an account, make your first purchase, and during checkout, make sure you use offer code DELL1. For $10 and $25 packages to get a free track, Delve 2 on $50 and $100 packages to get 5 tracks, or Delve 3 for $150 and $300 packages to get 10 tracks. That's like a full album for free just by using the code BattleBards.com. Go now. 
Gotta get the inspiration. I don't know how Nathan does this. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Dell's podcast. Right? Well, I'm weird. Right? Yeah. Hello and welcome to Dell. <laughs> nah, nah, that would be that would be kind of really off-putting. <laughs> He's gonna save that and throw it at the end of the show. I'm sure. <laughs> All right, I got this. Because Nathan does a really good job editing, and I'm sure when he's listening to this on the recording, he's going to go, yeah, I do do a good fucking job editing. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> That's great. <laughs>